<laughs> Hello and welcome to the Ratness Podcast, episode number 13 with Neil from Design Lab. Woo! Hey! Hey! What's up, dude? Nice to meet what? you, Neil. How you doing today, man? I'm good, dude. Just got done washing 85,000 pounds of clothing. Uh, <laughs> And I'm feeling good. I got a fresh new shirt that just got washed. So I'm good. Hell yeah. That's <laughs> a good feeling. I was almost tempted to be like, stay at the laundromat and just record the episode at the laundromat because the craziest shit always happens in like any laundromat <laughs> you're in, right? Did anything go down this morning? Did you see anything wild while you were there? Um, no, unfortunately not. I'm trying to think. Um, Although I, I did a Yelp review before going to the laundromat just to make sure I wasn't going to like a funky place. Um, but this place doesn't allow for, for dogs. And of course I had like my, my 15 year old wiener dog with me, um, inside of like this backpack thing that has all this mesh so that like he could breathe. Um, so I was kind of sketched out if, you know, I was going to get caught with my dog <laughs> on my backpack loading like shit ton of, like I had a, entire fucking truckload of laundry to do because our machine broke so um but anyway i'm good <laughs> good good hey, well, if the worst if the worst you got to deal with is is the, having an illegal dog on premises i think you're doing pretty good <laughs> especially a 15 year old We're, wiener dog dude no one can deny that that's no, just that's just cute i know <laughs> and he's an emotional support dog but like you know uh I don't know who's supporting who though. Cause like as soon as I leave, he, he's fucking like yelping and crying, like, you know, super anxiety and all that kind of stuff. So, but shout out to Whisket. That's, that's uh that's our wiener dog. Hey, yeah. holla, Whisket. Hey, life wouldn't be the same without our dogs, man, without our pets. You'll probably hear mine. If anybody decides to walk, walk past the front door, you're barking during the episode. They, they make our lives better. That's for sure. <laughs> what kind of, what kind of dog do you have? Uh, she's a Dutch shepherd. She's, oh, a, nice. she's like a canine looking dog. She, but she's sweet as hell. She's a guard dog at heart. She's sweet as hell. Oh. And then I have a two year old uh, wiener dog named Dottie. So I, I feel you on the emotional anxiety thing because she's a, she's like you said, I don't know who's comforting who most of the time because she, she needs me <laughs> just as much as I need her, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Is yours a, a miniature too, or it, is it like a full size? It's a mini, but it does have like longer legs than a lot of the miniatures I see. So I don't know if there is like some cross breeding in the you know generations behind it but uh she she's pretty small she's like 14 pounds word nice yeah uh whisk gets a handful we've had him since a pup and uh he's like like my 15 year old son yeah. you know <laughs> before my daughter was born like you know and and even more so now because he's like he, he's had one he's had his gallbladder taken out we basically saved his life with that surgery a couple years ago and, uh, so now like wherever I, I go, even on bike rides, bro, like I just, I take him, there's like this like backpack or like this biker sling yeah. and like the dog's face can like hang out. And so oh, I take good. him with me and, you know, I think he loves it though. Cause like, he's just in the wind, his yep. ears are just like, the, yeah, the, yeah, that's the best dude. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, so welcome to the dog podcast with uh, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> dog nest, bro. Hell yeah. <laughs> nah, but it is a very, it's a very important thing. It's a big part of my life. I've always, you know, had yeah. animals and, and dogs, especially. Um, so I, I love the little fuckers, no matter how much uh, torment they can yep. bring to your life. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, man. So let's jump in with you, though, uh, as part of the design lab. And uh, just want to give people a little bit background we don't have to go into everything uh right away but just to kind of show them where you're coming from um how did the design lab start and like how has it progressed since uh you've started moving it so um it's really interesting uh i guess i'll start with i'll start with the method makers because i think it's easier to talk about like my contribution to that and then how that ties in with design lab. So, um, the method makers is a global community of artists that I'm a content curator for. Um, there's artists from around the world that provide content that's posted there. And it's basically this, this community of, um, artists that are talented, creative, humble, um, that provide their work, 
uh, for the duty of social change, right? Like the, their work is uh, to inspire others to be better um, and to talk about things that are important to them uh, more, more so tied in with the creative, the, the freedom of creative expression, right? Um, we've been, I've been involved with the method makers since like on and off since 2012. And um, Design Lab was started in October of last year. So it's, it's not, not too old. It's less than a year old, actually. Okay. Uh, started during the pandemic. Um, and so I had a job in tech uh, for about a year, a little more than a year and a half. And um, the, uh, I unfortunately got laid off. Um, like they told us in October or sorry, in, in August that, you know, we basically had 60 days to find a job. Right. And, um, a job internally at the company I was working for. And then, um, I thought about it and I was like, you know, there's, there's actually a lot of people, um, like, like I've always been connected to my work with the method makers, whether it's like content that I'm providing for the community or, just some random project that one of my artist friends wants to work on or out exploring or doing something. Right. And, um, I thought about it and it was like, well, I could take these next 60 days. They basically told us like for 60 days, you don't need to do anything. Just find a job internally. That's the only job that you have and you have benefits for like the next two months. So I was like, shit, mm, that's, that's nice. the case. Then I'm going to just like, I have the choice to either take the path, to do the thing I really, really love, which is like go back into the work that I was doing creatively for the method makers. Um, which by the way, when I was directly involved, um, as the main, one of the main people, um, we were running a gallery in San Francisco for about two years. We've done projects where, uh, we've gone to the Philippines with, um, with some artists here in the, in the U S that, um, that went and painted with artists out there in the Philippines. So, um, there's, there's, um, there's a bit of a, a, a connect. Oh, thank you. Sorry. No, you're, you good. Say, <laughs> you're, you're on with the, hey. this is right. She's the other half. The <laughs> <laughs> I'm the whole other half. Yeah. She's the brains and the bronze. I'm just the mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I got tacos and burritos. Oh, so, awesome. Um, Food delivery. <laughs> all part of the flavor guys. Uh, Shit, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> so you're talking about um, having artists, American artists, go with you to the Philippines and uh, collab with uh, Filipino artists uh, out there? Um, yeah. Through the Method Makers Gallery. Was it called the Method Makers Gallery or was it its own thing? So um, in San Francisco, it was at the Hotel de Art. And the Hotel de Art was, you talked about David Cho. Uh, he actually has a room in there. So... If you ever get to, when you guys go back to San Francisco, if you guys have been to San Francisco, I'm sure. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, because you're on the West Coast. Um, in the city, there's this place called the Hotel de Art. Um, the original curator back in the early 2000s, his name was John Doffing. I'm putting John Doffing out there. He's like a, I don't know if he's ever been mentioned on a podcast, but that <laughs> guy's like a fucking legend. Um, shout out to John Doffing. Anyway, so he was the original curator. He got Shepherd Ferry, David Cho, Sam Flores, like all wow. of these guys that are heavy hitters Big now, hitters, right? Yeah. At the time, like they, they were just up and coming artists and he got them to paint a mural in every single room of this hotel. There's 35 rooms all muraled out, right? Oh, wow. Um, we had been curators of this hotel for about two years um, as a different name and then um, got an opportunity to... Uh, basically run the gallery in the hotel. So like five floors of, of gallery space wow. using the hallway walls. Mm -hmm. And, um, the name of the gallery, I don't know what the fuck it was called. Maybe it was just, <laughs> maybe it was called the method makers gallery. I don't know. Um, I'd have to look back at like Instagram back at that, that time. <laughs> but basically, um, we, we created San Francisco's first secret show where, um, we didn't tell anybody then like, and we called it the official method makers gallery or whatever we, we called it at that time. Um, we basically just said, we're throwing a secret art show. We're not going to tell you where it's at. And you had to buy tickets on brown paper bag tickets or whatever yeah. site it was. And then people just met like at the corner somewhere in San Francisco late at night when it was dark and like 
the first people that showed up, I remember their names. Paul Piskursky? Shit, I guess I don't remember his name. <laughs> <laughs> Paul and then this, this other dude, Matt, I think. And um, there was this other person. They just randomly showed up. And then, um, like, you know, we met at, like, like you know, some, the, the hotel's in the financial district, but there's, like, this cutty-ass spot with, like, you know, one of those rub and tug uh, ma- mm-hmm. massage parlors. Yeah. Um, and then you go through, like, this cutty alleyway. <laughs> um, and then, like... People are like, what the fuck are you, where are we going? You know, like, I don't know this fucking brown dude. He's just taking me like this random <laughs> place in like Chinatown or whatever. And then we get to the spot and like the hotel was built in 1906, like after the earthquake. Oh, dope. And it's got this ratchet, like, you know, um, elevator door where you have to like pull it open, yeah. close it. And then it goes up hella slow. Um, and, you know, the whole time I'm talking to them, like, do you have no, you have any idea where, where we're going? Like, um, you have no idea if I'm going to fucking kill you. You have no idea who I am. Right. And, yeah. uh, and they're smiling, of course, but I'm like, you won't be smiling if you really don't know where the fuck I'm going. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, we end up taking them to the, you know, the hotel and then we get into this elevator and then we go up and they're like, Oh shit. And so like this, this show was like Gats, Ernest Doty, um, Ernest Mancuso, um, basically, you know, who are now like majority of these guys are like the method makers now, right? Like they're like, after that show, like we ended up doing more projects together. And so that kind of established like the community of the method makers. And then, um, from that show, um, the method makers never really, never really like operated as a, a real gallery. We're more like a, when I talk about what the method makers is and you talk to any of the other curators that, that, that provide content um we're more like a skate team like um you know galleries not to talk shit about other galleries but like uh galleries constantly have to provide substance for their um their clients right they want to see new shit new shit like i want to see what what's new what's new what's mm-hmm. good what's good you know it's, it just kind of feels like you're in this rotation whereas like um if you look at our community it's like an Adam Sandler film, right? Like the same cast and characters, but like different roles, right? Yeah. Some are highlighted at certain times more than others stuff. They, they might be the star of this project and then they might just be in the background of another project. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. So that's like, um, that's kind of been the basis. Like Gas has been one of our longest running artists that we've worked with. Um, you know, he's, he was like one of the first artists that did the secret show with us. And here that was like 2013 and it's like 2021 right so all these years like we end up doing projects together and and doing stuff and um anyway so that's kind of like i think what what was like the launch pad for the method makers um design lab was started uh because i got laid off i had artists and people that were coming up to me the pandemic caused like this issue with uh people's businesses right like yeah, dude. um i've been doing consulting work for brands um, and for for people who who have businesses, things like that, since 1999, um, and I've always done that on the side. Like, I started my first clothing brand. It was called Underground Culture. This is way before MySpace, Friendster. Yeah, before, yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like before social media, right? Like, you'd have to print the shit yourself. I, I went to underground hip hop shows, and I was like carrying these these like this backpack full of shirts i would freestyle inside of like the cypher like after like a, a roots concert at stanford like me and my boys are just like beatboxing like jumping in the cypher and at the end like yo i got t-shirts who wants to buy an underground yeah. culture t-shirt? and like maybe one person did but i had to really convince them right they had no idea what the, what the fuck is this shit you know yeah. and um so that's where i got started you know and um since that time like from the progression of when the first social media thing started, I had a MySpace page. I'm sure like maybe some of you guys have a Friendster page. I had, you know, so from like all the way through that, that transition, like I've always done this creative stuff. Right. And it's just been like ingrained in my blood somehow, but I've always had to support my creativity with a full-time job. Yeah. And so now it's like 21 years later and, or at the time, 20 years later, and I have, um, an opportunity to like, am I gonna, am I gonna like actually 
do this thing full time or am I going to go back to like work in a corporate job mm-hmm. and like slave for somebody else, you know, or am I going to take the risk on myself? Right. And so, um, so I decided I'm going to do design lab and Remy and I said, okay, let's, let's do it. Right. And so, um, what happened was I ended up taking, uh, this course with, Parsons University and Complex, they did like, I don't know if you guys have seen the ads on Instagram, but um, they're offering like the, st- the streetwear course and you have to apply for it. Once you get approved, um, you learn about streetwear. And I've, I feel, I want to say like, I've been doing stuff with streetwear. Like when we start, we, we've run like two clothing lines before doing the Method Makers and now Design Lab, mm-hmm. okay. um, but really not really having an education in it. And so taking that course, like it just fucking blew my mind. Like, Oh, that's why people buy Supreme. Oh, that's the reason why, uh, the hundreds came up or like Maurice Malone or Mecca, or you want to talk about any brand during the golden era of hip hop from like woo wear to fat farm to today. Um, you know, like anyway, so I I've been like out of touch with fashion. I've never like, once I started doing stuff with the method makers and then design lab, it, it just, it was never really about apparel anymore or fashion. It was more like, um, like if you listen to our podcast, the method makers podcast is about just like how you want to know how people create. We want to know where does creativity come from? You know, like from the depths of your mind, like, like, uh, subconsciously, like, where does that, where does that come from? Right? Like anybody can, can draw a line, but where does the line where like, what is, when does the line become art? <laughs> and also, when, when does the line become so compulsive to you that you want to keep drawing it? Like, yeah. There's something yeah. about that. It's like anyone, we all are introduced as, as young kids to the idea of painting and drawing and creating stuff. But you, a lot of people lose it. And, uh, you know, what, what's the triggers that uh, keep someone going? Like, I, I've listened to a few episodes. And like I said, um, a couple of the guys I was familiar with, um, and so it was really interesting to hear kind of more background on their story and see kind of their influences as a kid and how they came up and how it reflects in their art today. And dude, you do a great job about um, asking the right questions and kind of pulling the conversation out of them. Uh, so like kudos on that. Thank you. I appreciate that. And you guys, yeah, just, and- you started the the podcast during the pandemic too. That was like kind of a response to not having um, the job anymore, right? Was that part of it? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, like we, we wanted to start the podcast and I want to give a, a special shout out to, um, uh, Paul Escalar. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. Uh, a good friend. Um, he just recently passed, um, very peace. suddenly this, this, this past weekend, um, we were supposed to do our first podcast episode with him in 2019. Um, and you know, he was going to be the first artist for this, virtual artist residency program thing that we were trying to do. And, um, and the podcast was going to be started with him, but a bunch of life stuff happened, ended up getting like a full-time job and whatever. So that didn't happen. But yeah, like to answer your question, um, because of the loss of the job and the response to the pandemic, just like you guys, um, you, you get an opportunity where a lot of the artists that we've interviewed are usually constantly on the road traveling. They're doing shows like they're, you know, um, they're hardly ever in their studio or if they are in their studio, they're way too busy. They can't, they can't talk. Right. And so, um, the opportunity to do a podcast in a period of time like this is like, you get people while they're in their studio reflecting on stuff and maybe even creating like the next masterpiece. Right. Um, and, uh, as the pandemic starts to ease up, people get their shots. Um, like people feel more comfortable. You can walk into a studio space now. Uh, and I'm doing like my first interviews, um, actually in studio spaces because, right. you know, people feel a little more comfortable right now. Yeah. That they've, they've, um, they've gotten the, the, uh, the vaccine or whatnot. So, um, yeah, we just we, got, we just got a chance to do our first couple in-person interviews on the podcast and rather than via zoom and it's uh, a, yeah. it's such a, be- a great experience, man. Like the, the zoom is <laughs> awesome. And the fact that we have the technology to be able to reach out to artists and have the interviews all over the U S or wherever the, 
there's no other time like it, you know, but there's still nothing like personal interpersonal contact. Yep. Yeah. I think I watched that interview. Um, cause you guys were in your space. Yeah. I think Jim was like across the way from another and then matt was next to somebody else yeah 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 we, we got it yeah. set up a couple ways we you know we had it originally set up for the zoom in here and then when we had someone come in in person we had to completely switch everything up we had to find a way to make it work man like like you're saying we started this because there was time and because the artists had time to be able to talk and and wanted shoot, give me something to do. I haven't been able to go to a show. I haven't been able to put anything out in so long. Please give me something to do. And we, I mean, we've got a great response from it. Um, but yeah, just having to start during the pandemic, you start on a completely different level than what you actually want to be at or where you actually want to go just because you have to make these adjustments. And that, that's that been a catalyst, I think, for a few people um, that we've talked to. We've done, this is going to be episode 13, but I would say half the people that we've interviewed for the show, at some point during the interview, they mentioned, well, there was nothing else to do. And it was either like double down on myself and and do the damn thing and like just chase your dreams or sit around and be bummed about it. Like everyone else. It's like, you have two options. Yep. Yeah. And I think you hit the the nail on the head with that because when I talk to people about, uh, that are actually using this time creatively, the first people that I, I heard talk about this was actually a podcast. Um, do you guys listen to broken record? Uh, it's a, it's a, uh, a podcast about like, how the musicians were inspired to create the beats that they have. I think the, the host is um, Rick Rubin oh, okay. and, and he, he interviews like musicians. And there was this, this one episode I listened to with the RZA. Mm. He's asking him about like, how did you guys create 36 chambers and things like that? And what's crazy is like RZA is like a fucking podcast host himself. And it almost felt like it was, a show as it was almost like the RZA was asking, it like, uh, yeah, flip flop <laughs> yeah. like, like, about all this stuff. You know what I mean? And um, anyway, so he they, they were talking about how you know because um, like the RZA is doing films, he's doing like like musical scores, and yeah. like you know he's got a whole bunch of shit going on. Um, and what's been beneficial for him and both him and Rick Rubin are that the fact that you have this period of time where you, you can't travel and you can't do anything. You have all these beats that you have laid on the shelf that have been sitting collecting dust for years. And now you can actually pull those tracks out and listen to them again and actually produce. And now you have like volumes and volumes of stuff. And so I think creative types like us take that time now to be in the studio, to actually like really hone in on their craft, you know, mm. like, design lab is really just a, a fancy way of saying my garage, right? Like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, uh, uh, we, yeah. Anyway. So, so I, I tell people that are putting in work like us right now, putting in, um, time and effort to create podcasts, to, to do things creatively. Um, when you use this time effectively, imagine like when the pandemic is over completely over. Right. Oh yeah. And it will be at some point. Um, and I think, um, when things start to open up and you've, you've created this body of work and you have something to show for and like, regardless of what it is, call it your resume, right? You can look back and say, look, I, I didn't spend hours upon end eating tubs of ice cream and watching Netflix. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I actually was creating some shit, you know? And then, um, you build your reputation for, for doing stuff like that. And I think people appreciate that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Hell yeah. That's a, that's the biggest thing is like, as an artist, you're only as good as you are self-motivating or mm -hmm. motivated by whatever. Um, it's really, really hard to like force yourself to be creative sometimes and to sit down and do the work, you know, it takes to produce something of high quality. Um, yep. but you know, when there's less of an excuse, when you don't have the job or you have a few extra hours that you're seeing consistently, it, it's kind of hard to deny that little voice in your head that says, Hey, like make something, do something with it. Um, as well as the podcast, did you do a social, social distancing, like art show, uh, this last year too? <laughs> yeah. So I'll lead into that. Um, I'm a very ambitious person with unrealistic expectations. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we all? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I will just fucking admit it, bro. Like, uh, I didn't even finish all the laundry today. <laughs> like, like for real, like I have a fucking, I drive a Tundra, right? And the whole fucking trunk is filled with shit. And like, I, I did pretty good though. Like I, I, you know, I used the biggest fucking washing machines and I dried everything. Hopefully they're dry. They're all in garbage bags <laughs> that are, they're sanitary or whatever. Um, I did this shit hella quick. And, um, but there's still one bag that didn't get washed, but it, it's the shit that it's like sheets, you know, like we got enough sheets. So we we're good for like, anyway. Um, <laughs> Hey, I swear that's like every artist MO though. Like, hey, I got everything I need. I don't that's not necessary, so I'm gonna put that off yeah, till let's later. Put that over here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You guys know this because you guys are both artists. Like I know I was I, I think I was watching an episode where Jim was talking about his work, like experimenting with some new things uh -huh. like in I, your own art. And Matt, I know you're an artist, um, but I don't know much about your art we got to get both of you guys on the show um and i think we talked about like doing some sort of cross where yeah yeah you know like part two of the episode of what we talk about is like the rat nest method made design lab or something hell right? yeah yeah no yeah. that that would be awesome to collaborate on something like that because i as you're explaining what you're doing with method makers and how design lab started and what how it kind of evolved there's a real similar it's almost like part one and part two, you know, you're going from where did the idea come from? How does creativity spark? And then we're like, all right, once you get that spark, what do you do to make it from point A to point B, you know? And it, it there's a really good co coinciding there that, that we all are kind of on the same page with that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I want to say that like, there aren't enough curators like us, like, I, I consider our role as like a, um, there's an art in itself in what we do as mm. curators and independently, um, you know, whether or not you, you do your own art outside of what you do for Ratness or what I do for design lab. Um, there's something to say about doing that, that type of role. Cause not everybody can manage like what we do. Some mm. people call it herding cats. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. Like I, I've never heard heard a cat. I've heard a cat. I've heard a cat having <laughs> yeah. sex, and it sounds like babies crying. Yeah. But like that's not what I'm sounds talking like about. Sounds like they're getting killed. Um, but like this is like it, this definitely takes a lot of time and effort. And um, to answer your question about the social distance show, the art show. Um. All right. So I will. I want to apologize for all the artists that have like given me their their art. We were supposed to launch tmmdl.com uh right after black friday like we wanted to do a cyber monday you know like oh everyone's got money and they're gonna like spend money and do all this right and then of course like all right we can launch the podcast but we can't launch the site it's just not realistic right not the way that we want to actually do it mm -hmm. and so um since that time we've been like working on stuff developing things and like you know the um the long game of trying to make something really, really good cannot be rushed. It cannot be forced. Right. Absolutely. Um, before this whole, and you guys are obviously have heard about this NFT explosion that's happened with cryptocurrency, like people that you didn't even know did art all of a sudden are putting out NFTs. <laughs> that's another fucking conversation. Um, so prior to that, we were trying to do, um, this gallery this is the the proprietary whatever but um that, that we talked about like on the, the nda thing um but so we were trying to put together um in our site a way for you to buy an artist's work using um a smart contract okay uh, are you guys familiar with with smart contracts how they work through ethereum i'm not can you <laughs> okay. can you explain because i i don't know yeah, 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 all good. I, so, I know, um, but I just want to find out if you really know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Because I don't. I'm just going to fucking bullshit it. No. Uh, no. So uh, the idea for this came from another podcast that I was listening to. Um, Swiss Beats was talking to, uh, was doing like a TED Talks podcast, like on art. And um, there was an artist who was, uh, he was standing next to, 
um, at this auction at um, Sotheby's, and it's like you know really fucking high class auction, right? right? Like millions of dollars or whatever. Yeah. Um, but this artist, this African American artist, sold his painting to P Diddy prior to this auction years ago for like a hundred thousand dollars, right? Diddy four or five years later turns around and sells and puts it up for bid on Sotheby's. It sells for like $20 million, right? This artist um, was at the auction. Swiss Beats was standing next to this artist, asked the artist and says, congratulations, you just became that artist that had the high, you're the living artist with the highest painting that ever sold for X amount of money, right? How do you feel? And he's like, shit, I don't know if I should be crying or if I should be happy. And Swiss was like, why would you be crying? It was like, well, shit, like I sold that painting to Diddy for $100,000. He turns around and sells it and he probably made like, I don't know, 15 million or something, yeah. right? How much of that went back to the artist? Um, when you think about like $100,000, right? How old is this artist? If let's say he's like in his 40s, how many years did it take for him to create the methodology to do that? The amount of schooling, the amount of emotional things like you guys are artists, right? You create from a different place. Like inspiration can come to you from an artist, other, other artists you admire, like, like your style is emulated a little bit. You, you take something from that, right? Um, or it could be life experience. You've gone through depression. You've had a suicidal episode. There's been homelessness that you've had to deal with there's like all these different things the trauma of life right like people create from all different places and so how do you quantify what that value is right, right? and then ongoing you know so if you think about like yeah he sold that for a hundred thousand but like maybe it was actually maybe it actually cost him ninety thousand because school uh materials supplies emotional distress blah 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 right Whereas an artist like Swiss Beats, he creates music, it gets used in film, it gets used in commercials, it gets used wherever. He gets licensed royalties from that, right? Right. So a smart contract would, would essentially um, create the ability for an artist to continuously get paid for their work. If there was a smart contract connected to this person's work, he sold it to Diddy. Diddy signed the smart contract. In that smart contract, using cryptocurrency, Putting that on the blockchain, um, as soon as Diddy decides to sell it, there's something written in digital code that basically that? says, "Look, if you sell this work of art, I'm going to get a royalty of X percent every time it changes hands." And so that wallet that's connected to that smart contract, any time that this work sells, that artist would have gotten a piece of it. And so, what I'm trying to do is find a way to create a smart contract. Um, that can be connected to any artist's work. And I feel like every gallery should be doing this. With, Absolutely. With, uh, it seems like a no brainer that artists would want that, man. That's a, that's an incredible contract to have as an artist. Exactly. And so these NFTs, right? So the NFT explosion happens. NFTs are not anything new. If, if like you've been paying attention, like, right. like years ago, like I think crypto punks were the first, um, and I legit have an email thread between myself and the CEO of, of, um, of uh super rare which at the time three years ago was called something different mm -hmm. they approached the method makers and and asked about trying to do something and i'll apologize to john crane right now and say um when you hit me up three years ago what the fuck is anyone going to do with digital art right like uh. I'm, the, I'm like the fucking, i'm like i'm like uh bill gates uh when he said the internet's not going to do anything you know yeah uh, or whoever it was that said that uh, so I feel like an, like an idiot. Right. Um, but at the same time, like I didn't dismiss him. I just said, look, like I, I had a full-time job at the time. Um, at the time I was handing the keys to who was managing the method makers to the community. And so like, y you know, my, my time was split. So it wasn't like that full attention, but NFTs work the same way. Um, when you, when you use Ethereum to create an NFT, I, I want to say there is a smart contract capability there. So if you own a, a digital NFT and you decide to resell that, there's something in the smart contract that says this person that sells directly from the blockchain can resell it. And that original artist gets that royalty every time it, it exchanges hands. Right. And so um, that's the beauty of, of NFTs 
and smart contracts. You can do smart contracts with anything. Like they're talking about in the future, if not now, um, car loans will have smart contracts where like if you don't pay your loan on time, they'll have like something tied to the ignition of the car. It won't start if you don't pay, you know, oh, wow. or something like that. Anyway, um, but yeah, so like this NFT explosion thing happened um, and like we weren't thinking about NFTs at all. So now like we have some things in development to try to do our own NFT gallery. Um, that's just, can't really talk about it. In- yeah. Sure, hey, sure, sure. Like hey, we get it. Rule one of yeah. method makers. Don't talk about method makers, dude. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're breaking the rules today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, so <laughs> I, I want to jump back just a little bit. I got uh, something clicked in my head. When we're talking about kind of creative process and, and you're talking about going from literally hustling t-shirts in a cipher to like curating these galleries and stuff and everything in between. And then you start a podcast during, so you've already been doing method makers for years. You already kind of have grinded your way up and then have this time during the pandemic and you chose to pivot rather than keep doing the same thing. You kind of chose to, to, pivot off to a parallel path, but a different path nonetheless. How did that kind of change your view of the industry or your kind of own art process that you were kind of involved in anyway, having to now learn about NFTs a hell of a lot more, figuring out these smart contracts to, so that you can be kind of the up and coming the, or the, be on top of the up and coming way that it's, everything is going to be handled. How did that kind of affect you in, in this pivot point? And now looking back, you know, two years ago, I'm sure you're in a different place than you expected to be just because of kind of those changes. How has that affected you? Uh, I think change is good. I think that it's important to be nimble. Um, I feel like it's important to keep your ear to the street and to understand what's going on. You know, people have old ways of thinking because they're resistant to change, right? Mm -hmm. Like I feel like the more that you try to resist change, the harder that your life gets, right? But like if life is like an ocean and you can just like flow it, I'm looking at the painting behind, it's like a beautiful painting and I'm thinking (laughs) of the ocean and how it flows. Um, But like, you know, life and even life as as a creative, um, you almost have to go with the flow wherever you go, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's important to, um, to stay up on as much as you can um, so that you can make wise decisions um, and not so abrupt, you know? Because everything can change, right? Like, oh yeah. E- even with like, so I was talking to like one of our, one of our advisors about this NFT thing. Um, He's, uh, I don't think I could mention his name, so I'll just, I'll call him Ty. So Ty basically told me, um, you know, he was a, a, an early miner of Bitcoin, like oh, when okay. it started back in 2012. So he has this experience, like having to run big machines, having a, a cool room in order to, to actually mine some of this stuff. Right. And, um, we we're talking about this NFT thing, like a couple weeks or maybe a week into the first one being sold for like 60 million or something like something crazy like that. Yeah. And, um, and I told him like, what, what are your thoughts on this? Right. And it's like, I mean, I don't know if it's the pandemic and people just have tons of money and they just want to fucking throw it away. But like, I mean, you definitely need to get on this thing, but you also like have to know that this is just another canvas, man. Like, you know, an NFT is, you know, like forget technology. And we're just like living in the old days and all you got is like paper, ink, paint, canvas, right? Like an NFT is just the digital. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It happens to be like, like the people who want to own NFTs want to own it on their phone. They, they don't want to take the big ass painting and bring it to like the next place. Like they don't buy cars. They use Ubers and Lyfts, right? Like, um, the investment of, of uh, just being able to own something super quick and say like you paid X amount of money for it. Like, I don't know what happens when you lose your phone though. Anyway, (laughs) (laughs) Um, but like my point is like uh, when you look at things very simply, you know, as, as much as like we're, we're fucking bombarded by a bunch of shit every fucking day, like there's things that are constantly changing. Right. 
Um, and the important thing is to try and keep things really simple. And I think that um, when, I tr when I try to do that and I try not to force too many things, um, that's where I don't, I don't end up getting uh, bombarded and feeling like overwhelmed, you know? Sure, yeah. And I also have to like remember that like um, life is constantly changing. Um, a shout out to my brother Akira Beard, who was the first person that introduced me to the law of impermanence. Um, it basically says that like nothing lasts forever. The only you know, constant is change. Our lives, <laughs> like where we stand uh, to be like the greatest of whatever. Um, or, you know, if you idolize any heroes, like just know that like your heroes like Tiger Woods can have sex scandals. Mm -hmm. um, like, you know, like random shit like that can happen and things change, you know? And so it's just important to be nimble um, and to keep things simple. Yeah. So kind of, so what I'm hearing from you is it wasn't necessarily a, a choice to kind of pivot more than it was nece necessary. It was out of necess necessity. Excuse me. I can't even talk right now. Um, you saw an opportunity to kind of a be at the forefront of this upcoming thing, but also learn something new and, and expand what you're doing and kind of had to, it sounds like, uh, and, and adapt rather than being so stuck or saying, I've tried to do it this way for so long, I'm going to just keep doing it this way. Uh, that That's really mature. Yeah. That's a, that's a tough thing for a lot of people to be able to do, man, is to recognize, Hey, I've done it right. And I've done it well, but I need to adjust and I need to adapt because this is not going to stay the same. You know, this, this idea might eventually have a sex scandal and I need to make sure that I put my eggs in some other baskets. But, I would, I would love to see an NFT sex scandal. I mean, yeah. I Dude, you don't want to know how much they're paying for that nft yeah. <laughs> oh no that's great that's great man uh i i had a question just kind of like a follow-up to what we were just talking about as someone that has dealt with um i guess you could say more traditional forms of medias that the artists that you're involved with use that people have been using for decades um if not centuries you know uh to some degree is it weird when you talk to people now or is, do you kind of find that artists are starting to have the same realization that you were of like, you have to adapt, you have to change. We have to get into everything we can get our hands in if we want to like stay on top and be creative. Uh, or do you, do you feel like a lot of uh, pushback when you talk to artists about uh, doing stuff in a non-traditional format? It's interesting. So I work with a lot of different artists in the respect of like being up on shit and then like fuck the internet like <laughs> you know like full spectrum <laughs> um i won't say the name but um really good friend of mine and uh and actually you have some of his work uh i sent i sent a print to you guys it is it's off this camera but you can see it in our second shot we have yep. it hanging up behind us Beautiful, beautiful. Um, so um, he, uh, I fucking love this dude um, because his work is amazing. Yeah, it um, is. He's like very paranoid about that kind of stuff. Like, like, you know, and it's almost refreshing to have that kind of viewpoint, right? Because we live in a world right now where you have literally three to five seconds to look at something. You can scroll up or you can scroll this way. Yep. You know, I'm talking about Instagram, right? And how fucking gnarly it is to like, you know, you could spend like four or five months creating this amazing piece of work and someone's going to literally spend three seconds on it. <laughs> yeah. Two thumbs and then move on. Right. How fucking ridiculous is that? Right. Um, and you know, Whenever I talk to him, uh, it's always fucking refreshing to, to have a conversation with him because things fucking slow down, right? Like, mm -hmm. um, I'm not talking about speech impediment or anything like that. I'm talking about like, <laughs> just like, all right, we, we don't have to be on our phones it's while a, we talk. It's we like living actually, in like, the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Constant, just like in the moment kind of thing. Right. And, um, 
And that's kind of the same experience that I want, that we're hoping to provide when we launch TMMDL's website. When we, when we TMMDL.com, you'll need a password to get in, first of all. Um, so that means Exclusive. you have to register for our site. When you have it, you'll be able to go on and, and purchase the work from the artist. Um, but you'll notice that things are slow. Like if you want a fast paced world and you want to like consume content, you want to consume like hours and hours of creativity um, in a very short period of time while you're taking a dump, then you go to Instagram, right? But if you actually like want to enjoy the conversations that we have with the artists, um, just like how we're having a conversation or you want to hear about like you know, the same way that the Rat Nest pod podcast uh, listeners would go to understand how something is created um, and what inspires that. Um, imagine that like on a site, right? And you're yeah. like looking at the work and then you can, and this is like, I encourage anybody that's curating anybody's work to, to find a way to do that, right? Because, you know, um, you go to a podcast to listen to us talk and us bullshit and like, you know, like talk deep about things that are important to us, right? You go to Instagram to like get your quick fix. The surface stuff, yeah. And it's just like, um, what what's different from that is like being able to provide that same experience. People can't go to galleries the same way that they used to, where they can spend hours upon end looking at work, going to an artist opening and listening to them talk, conversing with them, things like that, right? And so the importance of having a, a space where you can slow down a little bit and, and actually do that. That's, that's what we're trying to create. I don't know if I answered your question. I think I just started going off on a tangent, dude. No, no but so you, sorry. you, so you brought up a really good point or made me think of something really interesting between NFTs and traditional art. Like you're saying people in, in a digital art form platform, most of the time look at it for three seconds and then go along when it, when you have a painting that actually hangs on the wall, it's there. It is, on the wall, every time you walk in the room, no matter what, you can't help but have it in your peripherals at least, even if you're not looking at it, it's there and influencing you in ways that you don't get to choose. But a kind of a digital art or the digital art platform with NFTs, people now have to choose to go on and look at it, decide to leave it up on their phone or go and do something different. And it, it can have a, art is gonna have a completely different effect on people in that manner, because now you have to have some sort of impassioned feeling within the first three seconds. You're not going to get art where people stand there for an hour in a gallery and look at it unless they choose to put it on their phone or print it out to look at it. And then you're converting it into kind of the old style media. So I'm, I'm yeah. interested to see how that's going to affect, affect that going forward. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I mean, Matt, what was your original question? It was, uh, it was just whether, um, you saw like a pushback from artists. You were saying like, especially uh, the guy, uh, the printmaker who made this uh, just kind of like when you talk to him, time slows down. He has a kind of the old school mentality about the whole situation. And I was just wondering how, how common uh, you encounter that because I feel like in the conversations we have with people uh, it is more of a traditional paper pen paint kind of aesthetic that they work with. I haven't or, or music or something, but like we haven't really dive deep with someone that strictly does digital art or 3d animation for that matter, yeah. or, um, you know, video game, um, programming stuff. Like, so I'm just curious if, if, cause you said you had a tech background too. I don't have any, uh, history in that field at all. So I was just wondering if you saw like a big kind of shift in the way people look at stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely, we get, we definitely have more project work around nfts like we have we have an artist from design lab that that animates illustration work for people you know if, if they want to create their first nft and they need somebody Holla! <laughs> yeah. um, if, if um but yeah so i mean we have that um and i would say it's kind of a mixed bag right like um the artists that have traditionally been painting and and doing you know murals and uh, commissioned work or prints and, you know, just like the things that we hang, like what you see behind me, uh, what's behind you. Um, all that stuff is, um, still there. And I think a majority of that is still there, but there's definitely, 
an influx of people interested in wanting to digitize the work that they're doing. Um, I embrace it because I feel like, you know, the right way to actually sell an NFT is uh, like, if you want to like separate the men from the boys is uh, <laughs> you, you create an NFT and use that as a smart contract for the original works of art that you sell. Right. Because if you sell an NFT, you have a digital file. Right. And like for old school guys like us, it's like, what the fuck am I going to do with a fucking GIF on my phone? Yeah. <laughs> but like, if you have a GIF on your phone, that's the only GIF on your phone. Um, that's also connected to like a work of art that you can actually hang. I feel like that's got more clout, right? Sure. Like if you sell this NFT and you sell the original work of art, you know, every time that exchanges hands and that becomes a smart contract or there's a smart contract tied into that. Every time that that sells the original artist, potentially the original curator like design lab will get a percentage of that. Yeah. Right? And that becomes the royalty and that becomes um, the way that generations upon generations, like imagine if Picasso had an NFT and his entire family was able to get paid from the work. I mean, that's probably not a good example because I'm sure like, I mean, what the fuck do I know? But like <laughs> if Picasso, if Picasso's family, like uh, didn't have rights to his work, right? right? Like museums or whatever, like there's no endowment from, you know, his work getting exchanged hands from museum to museum. Um, then, you know, who knows, like his great, grandson might have been like the next Picasso that was like a Picasso, um, but had no opportunity because of that, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. So yeah. dude, um, moving forward here, uh, we're, we're going to be wrapping up in a few, but I just wanted to ask you one more time. You got tmmdl.com, uh, launching pretty soon. And then yeah. what, any other projects you want to mention or shout out um make sure you, you let them know on? where they can listen to your podcast as well um uh, the name of yeah. that yeah yeah so um let's see uh we are gonna finalize a few more episodes like we gotta get you guys uh on our podcast the rat nest podcast <laughs> on the method makers podcast. I don't know why I'm doing the voice. <laughs> that was a good, good talk, podcast. We're going to talk like that the whole interview when we do yours. <laughs> we're going to talk like this every time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. So uh, we, we have just a few more episodes that we'll record. And then I promise like we'll cut it. We'll end it. And then post-production, my brother, Michael, um, who's like the head of video production for design lab. Um, is the one that's going to be doing all the posts. Remy, who had a short cameo here, she's doing all the intros. So um, we do all of this because um, the Method Makers podcast is a, just like your guys' podcast is very special, right? Like people are are able to tell their, their story. And um, the plan is to be able to do some sort of uh, collaborative project with each of the artists that we work with. And those get exhibited on tmmdl.com. Because we're behind on the social distance show, and we're still holding the work, and that's supposed to go up on tmmdl.com, and we've already published the podcast. Um, our plan is to publish this work, let it run for however long it takes to sell the work, one between one and a half to two to three months. Um, then we'll slowly start to introduce season two and season two might start with originally it was going to start with swoon. Cause we interviewed swoon. Hell yeah. Like, um, fuck, like I think in December or January and that episode's already done. Like I could, I could send you guys the private YouTube link. You could watch it and yeah. listen to it. Mama. Yeah. <laughs> you guys will be able to see it. Nobody else. Yet, right? <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, so, she was supposed to be the first episode. There's all this Asian hate stuff that's happened. I'm not sure if you guys have seen on the news, but like, um, unfortunately, it's just I have crazy shit. And so we've we've actually interviewed um, Filipino American, Asian American artists to talk about some of that stuff. So that might go to the forefront of what's published first, and then publish some of these sequentially later. It just depends. Um, but I don't even know how many episodes deep season two is. I want to say it's probably like. 14 or 15. Oh, right on, dude. man. And, Hell yeah. You know, so we, we've, we've been able to 
to publish previews on Method Makers Podcast Instagram. So if you follow Method Makers Podcast on Instagram, you'll you'll be able to see an archive of the the guests that will show up in season two, including Swoon. Um, and then if you follow Method Makers on Instagram, that is the community of artists that we work with. Um, you'll probably see some content from the podcast on there as well. Um, and then Method Made on Instagram is the ins- the official Instagram of the Method Made Design Lab or Design Lab for short. Okay. Um, and, and that's myself and Remy, Michael, and um, uh, a bunch of little Smurfs running around trying to... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just keep Smurfing. <laughs> yeah. Dude, well... Shit, I think uh, we're going to wrap it up, but thank you so much for, for coming on here and talking with us, man. I know we were going back and forth, and it, for a minute there, I was like, it might just not happen for a while, and I'm so glad we were able to find the time and like sit down and have this talk. Likewise, man. Yeah, yeah and I'm excited to talk to both of you guys again, because I want to dive in deeper about what you guys are doing creatively, um, and I'm sure like offline, I if you guys have individual instagram accounts i'm gonna instantly follow them and start trolling you <laughs> along with my little smurf friends here on the side <laughs> yeah. but you know what i mean nah, so. dude hell yeah same i mean we love what you're doing uh, we're really excited to talk to you not only because of who you work with but the fact that you like like you said curating is kind of a, a special thing Uh, You have to be creative and artistic and love it, but you also have to be a little bit more business oriented Mm -hmm. and uh, time conscious and all that stuff that goes along with trying to, like you said, wrangle a bunch of cats who are essentially artists trying to do their own thing at every time. And if you ask for something on Tuesday, it's coming Friday, you know, so we, we know exactly how to adapt and, and roll with the punches, but thank you so much, brother. We really appreciate you. Yeah, I, honestly, thank you for being so educational today, too. I uh, I thought I had an idea of smart contracts, and you actually laid it completely out right there. And I, I know a lot of the listeners are going to be appreciative of that, too, just uh, the education that was dropped in this. So thanks, bro. Right on. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Igato before I go. And I want to ask you, I didn't even get to ask, how do you guys know Igato? Uh, so <laughs> fun story. Um, when I first moved to San Diego, uh, you, you're familiar with his law of his work. And this is a uh, 10, 15 years ago, we became familiar of each other because we were, um, drawing similar things and people would mistake his work for mine and vice versa or tag us and stuff. And we'd say, Hey, no, it's this guy. I think we had like fake beef at one point like people thought we didn't like each other and then um, i remember that the most bro dude i was like this guy when he finally i finally met him i was like he's gonna kick my ass and we were just totally cool like right off the bat uh nicest guy and uh we were actually weird neighbors for uh years so we just bump into each other okay yeah so uh i mean we've we've worked he's done art shows everything i curated in san diego he was always a part of always down for the cause uh we did some charity shows and then just some regular shows together and um, yeah, just, you know, been a fan of his work. And it's, it's awesome to see not only his progression, but the fact that it's, it, he's just starting to get a little bit more uh, credit, a little bit more uh, come up. I think people are starting to really get into it and yeah. uh, stuff like you giving him a platform because he's, he's a pretty shy dude. Um, so it was funny just to even listen to him on the podcast because I was like, damn, dude, that might be the most... Uh, I've ever heard him talk in an hour, you know, <laughs> That's dope. but yeah, shout out. I got though. If you don't know, go check it out. Go check it out. Great work. Um, yep. and then one more time, dude, I just want to mention, um, you're the homie that passed away. Uh, can you shout out like the GoFundMe? We'll put it at the end in the description. I know, uh, that always helps for the family. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's on method makers, Instagram right now on the bio, uh, depending on when this is published, um, it'll stay there or, you know, it, it'll change, but, um, I'll send it to you guys. So definitely check it out on the, on the bio, wherever you guys are listening to this on Google podcast, Spotify, YouTube, uh, your mama's living room, your brother, your sister, your mama and your cousin too, yeah. um, <laughs> wherever, wherever it's at. But yeah, um, shout out also to Paul Escalar, uh, and his family. Um, he was an amazing dude and uh he was super unreliable 
but um, very creative. Uh, you know, uh, it wasn't like wrangling cats with you, bro. It was it was like working with someone that um, you could never force to do anything that uh, you didn't want to do. And uh, and I appreciate you providing that. And I will definitely remember to close the door when I'm in the bathroom um, and lock it. Um, anyway, uh, that, I have no idea why I said that. But uh, uh, Real moment, uh, man. Rest, rest, in, rest peace, in peace. Until we see you again. Hell yeah, dude. All right, man. Well, that's well, been it for the Rat Nest podcast this week. Thank you, Neil from Design Lab. Appreciate you, Method Makers. Check it all out. We're going to have links to everything when we post this. Should be out in like a week. Uh, we're doing a pop-up in North Carolina next Friday, so we're going to be running around, flying around. Yeah. Um, and we'll try, oh. we'll try to get it out that week, though, if we can if we can swing it. Yeah. Dude, uh, let's definitely try to record your episode soon so that we can – like at least for the preview, give you guys something that you can use to promote that show. Hell yeah. I would love to, I, I want to know more about it too. Dude. Yeah. Anytime, not even like, like let's definitely do that, but just hit me up, bro. Like stay in the loop. Like you said, you're going to smurf me. I'm going to smurf you. We're going <laughs> to, we're going to be all over each other, bro. So let's just stay in contact. It was a pleasure. I'm so happy, dude, that you came on and talked with us. Seriously. Thank you, bro. Thanks for being on. Thanks for being so open and honest with us about everything you're doing. And, uh, yeah, it was it was a great conversation. Yeah, likewise, guys. Thank you. All right, dude. All right, man. Take care. Take care, bro. Peace. You want to do? Uh, oh, guess not. I mean, in that, I'll do an outro in here. Okay, perfect. This has been another episode of the Ratness Podcast. You can check us out every week at Ratness Podcast on YouTube, uh, Ratness Podcast on Apple, Google, and Spotify. And Ratness Sticker Co. for any art that's available, um, prints, shirts, stickers from people we talk to, people we represent. Um, just follow us. We might just start posting rants. I feel like ranting a lot more lately. So we'll get into that. Yeah, we're going to do that. We're going to do that. Yeah. Hey. Hey. You look good. You look good. Hey. All right. You guys take care. <laughs> See you next week. See ya.